All right, good morning, everybody. So thanks very much for having us, and thanks for coming. So my name's Josh. I'm from the TensorFlow team at Google. And I know this is being simultaneously translated um, from English to Japanese, so I'll do my best to speak slowly. If I speak too fast, um, please just wave at me, and I'll slow down. Also, we have a pretty small group, so if you have questions anytime, uh, just interrupt me, and I'm, I'm happy to take them. And I'm here today with Amit, also from Google, and he'll be giving the second half of this uh, workshop. Uh, so today, we're going to get started with TensorFlow 2.0. And we're going to start the first exercise in about two minutes. I just want to give some quick background on what TensorFlow is and what we're going to do. Um, so today, we're going to do a programming workshop. It's going to be hands-on. There's nothing to install in advance. All you need is a laptop. If you don't have an internet connection, please try and get one uh, now while I give these uh, next couple of slides. And basically, we'll start with some beginner examples, things like linear regression, MNIST. And then in the second half, as time permits, we'll do some really cool advanced examples, things like Deep Dream, image captioning, machine translation with sequence to sequence models, all the really cool stuff. But we'll start with the absolute basics, because deep learning is a huge space. And the most important thing is to learn the fundamentals and then scale up from there. And just to be clear, um, uh, we don't have many prerequisites for this workshop. We can't teach you everything there is to know about deep learning or TensorFlow in the three hours that we have. Um, but the goal is just to get started, and you can continue learning uh, on your own. So just a quick slide. TensorFlow is an open source deep learning library. Uh, the most important thing about TensorFlow is the user community. So it was released about three and a half years ago by Google, and we're coming up on uh, 2,000 uh, people who have contributed code to TensorFlow all around the world, which is awesome. The most important thing about TensorFlow 2 is that it's easy to use. The number one thing we care about is making it as easy to use as possible. And we will be using uh, the latest version of TensorFlow 2.0 today. And that's in alpha, uh, which means a preview release. But we'll install it and use it. It's great. Um, my favorite thing about deep learning is not what we're going to do in the first half of this workshop. So when you learn about machine learning, you learn about fundamentals and bread and butter. And the most important machine learning skills are classification and regression, usually on structured data. That means tabular data, like a CSV file or a spreadsheet. Maybe you're writing a recommendation engine, or you want to predict something about your customers. And these are things you can do with classical algorithms, like decision trees and random forests, and it's very important. Deep learning is a different category of machine learning. And in deep learning, we usually work with high dimensional data. And there are things you can do in deep learning that's fundamentally new. So this is an example, and we have a tutorial for it on the website. But this is a problem called image captioning. And the goal of image captioning, which is probably why you want to learn about deep learning, is we take a picture, and we train a model to automatically generate a caption that describes the scene. And things like this are fundamentally new and completely outside the realm of what's possible with everything I learned about when I took machine learning in school many years ago. Um, uh, but we will circle back to this. We could spend a whole day just on this. So we'll start from the basics. So here's what we're going to cover. First, we're going to install TensorFlow. And I'll show you how to use our development environment for today called Collaboratory, which is the coolest thing since the microwave. It's absolutely amazing. Then we'll walk through linear regression. What we'll do is we'll create some points, and we'll find the best fit line using the equation y equals mx plus b that you might have learned back in high school. And then for people who have done machine learning before, this might put you to sleep. But uh, if you're new to it, we'll walk through MNIST. And MNIST is the hello world of computer vision. And then as uh, Amit will teach you how to work with uh, CSV files, which is a critical, critical skill. It's the number one thing people do in industry. And then we'll get to the advanced stuff. And um, I'll come back to this later. So let's get started. Um, we're going to walk through linear regression. And with your laptop, what you can do right now is head to this URL. So bit.ly slash tf dash ws1. And what I will do is walk you through this notebook and explain what's happening. And then we'll take 10 minutes, and you can try it. I'm not reading my text messages, just so I can time, time what we're doing here. So if we bring up that URL, let me show you what happens. So 
So this is our first exercise, and we're looking at this inside something called Collaboratory. So just so you know before we start, this notebook is on GitHub, and what we're looking at is a Jupyter notebook on GitHub, but we've opened it inside Collaboratory, which is what you see on the screen. And Collaboratory, it's a free Jupyter notebook environment that runs on the cloud. There's no way to pay for it if you wanted to. Um, it's provided by Google Research, and it's intended for uh, tutorials and education. And the nice thing about Collaboratory is that it comes with a free GPU, which you don't need for these exercises. But what I want to do right now is explain how this works. We are running on a virtual machine somewhere in Google Cloud, and you have root access to the VM. So you can install whatever you want. Um, uh, let me show you how to connect to a virtual machine. The first thing you do is hit connect. Usually it's much faster than this. So now we're connected. So I have some VM on the cloud. If you're new to Jupyter Notebooks, there's two types of cells. This is a markdown cell, and all cells can be edited and executed. In a markdown cell, if I just write some HTML or markdown, and I press Shift Enter, I can run the cell. Right, so there's what I just entered. And the other type of cell is a code cell. And Shift Enter or Play will run the code cells. And the very first thing we're going to do is install the latest preview version of TensorFlow 2.0. What's cool is you'll notice that this command is starting with an exclamation point. And so just to show you, if I did ls, when I execute the cell, I get to see the directory I'm in on the virtual machine. And if I wanted to, I could do rmrf star or whatever. This data all lives on the cloud. You can't mess anything up. So the very first thing we're going to do is install TensorFlow 2. And this will take a minute, um, but what's great is this won't affect your local machine at all. And this will get a little bit repetitive, but all of the notebooks we do today are gonna use this version. So we might do this a couple times, but um, that's great. So while that's chugging along, I'm going to explain what we're going to do. In this notebook, we're gonna create a scatter plot, just some points like this. And then we're gonna do two things that are cool. The first thing we're gonna do, and I'll explain how this works in a sec, is we're gonna find the best fit line. And the reason we're doing this is we'll use this to introduce concepts like loss, gradient descent, making predictions. And although this is a simple example with linear regression, these are exactly the same concepts. They hardly change at all that you use to train deep neural networks. Then what we're gonna do just for fun is I wanna explain how gradient descent works and we're gonna produce this diagram. And the code for this diagram is horrible. I wrote it last night. The first part of this code is very clean. So the TensorFlow part is great. I'm not good with plotting, so this code is a disaster, and you shouldn't use this as a good example, but I just made it so we can see what gradient descent is doing. And I will walk you through this code, and then I'll stop talking after I'm finished for like five minutes, and you can try it out. The first thing we do is we import TensorFlow, and I'll talk about what TensorFlow is right after we finish this exercise but for right now you can think of it as a Python library like NumPy. And then I'll talk a lot about Keras later. And Keras is TensorFlow's high-level API. It's wonderful. It's absolutely the best thing I've worked with in a long time, but we're not gonna use it here. I'm actually, we don't actually need this. I should fix this notebook, whatever. The first thing we're gonna do is this is just regular Python. There's no machine learning. What we're doing is just creating some points. And the important thing is each point will be an example and um, uh, this will be our training data. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create two variables. And these are learning in the context of deep learning means finding good values for variables. Our variables here, there's just two. There's M and B. M is the slope and B is the intercept. And we're gonna start with a random guess for M and B and we're going to gradually improve our guess over time. Here I could have used a random guess like tf.random.normal. I just decided to pick zero because why not? So that's our random guess for the starting values. And uh, we're gonna try and find better ones. And if you look when I generated the data, we generated the data according to this distribution. So the correct value for m is 0.1, the correct value for b is 0.3. And we're gonna see if we can recover these uh, with TensorFlow. So the ingredients for deep learning you always need three things. The first is you need a way to make a prediction. So given an x-coordinate, how do we predict y? 
if we were doing image classification, given a picture, we'd predict if it was a cat or a dog. Same idea. Here, our predict is just y equals mx plus b. And the first thing, if you've written TensorFlow before, uh, in TensorFlow 2, you'll notice this works exactly like Python. We're not using any placeholders, we're not using any sessions, this is just regular Python code. So there's our predict function. The second thing you need in deep learning is a way to know how badly uh, we did. So loss is another word for error. It's just a fancy word for error. And error is just a single number that describes how bad our prediction was. And the error in linear regression is going to be the square difference between, the square distance between all of our points in the line. So what we do is we take every point on the training data, we measure the distance to the line, we square it and we add that up. So it's this distance plus that, plus that, plus that. And the idea is that the best fit line will have the minimum distance to all the points. The way that we write that is with this. So this basically says, take the average of the squared difference between the values for y we predicted and the values for y we wanted. And this, the important thing is loss returns a single number. And in the notebook, you can see our starting loss for our guess. That actually looks pretty good. I wonder if I've accidentally trained this before. But our starting loss is this number here. And we're gonna try and minimize that. Okay, here's where the actual machine learning part happens. And believe it or not, actually training a neural network, which we'll do in the next exercise, can be written much more concisely than this. So we can train these models with a single line, model.fit. Here I'm writing this in a very low level way, but it's low level so you can see all the moving pieces. We're going to do some number of iterations, and the idea is at each iteration, we're going to predict the y values for all the points, we're gonna calculate the error, and then we're going to nudge the slope and the intercept a little bit in the right direction. And over time, they'll get closer and closer to the correct value and the error will become lower and lower. So we're gonna do 200 steps, and what we're going to do, and this is what TensorFlow gives you. First, we do our predictions. So here's all the y values that we predicted. Then we calculate the squared error, and so far this is all just regular Python. And here's, what, here's the first place where TensorFlow starts helping us. So we get the gradients. What a gradient is, is we need to know if we should move m and b up or down. With the slope, there's only two options. We can make it, these are both numbers, right? So there's only two things we can do. We can make them a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller. And we need to know which direction to wiggle them in and by how much. And the way we get that is by using calculus. We take the derivative of the loss with respect to the weights. And TensorFlow does that for us here using automatic differentiation. So it's one thing that TensorFlow does is it's a calculus library. Um, but we don't need to worry about the calculus here because it's built in. So the gradients will be a list of numbers that tell us which way to wiggle M and B. And what we're doing here is we're wiggling them a little bit. So here we're gonna increase them or decrease them by the right amount, and then we'll repeat. And as we run this, you can see at each step, our squared error is getting lower and lower and lower. And I don't wanna go into too much detail. There's lots of different things we could play with here. You could learn about learning rates, you could learn about different gradient descent strategies, but here we've written gradient descent from scratch. TensorFlow has a million built-in functions to help with this. But we're doing it all from scratch. So our loss has gone down. Once we've finished training, we can predict the values for M and B. And what's cool is we started with M equals 0.1 and B equals 0.3, and we've more or less recovered those with our little gradient descent loop. And then we can plot the best fit line. And so this notebook is giving you an example of, um, from scratch, writing gradient descent to find values for M and B. And I wanna show you the horrible code that I wrote and just explain uh, what's going on. So I don't care about the code, but I do care about this picture. And so this is a really important diagram. What we're looking at on the, on the Z axis, I guess, on our loss, our loss is the squared error. With our random guess, and I made a new random guess here, our initial loss is very high. It's, I don't know, 1.9 or something like that. And you can see the loss as a function of M and B. So as we use different values for M and B, we, get, uh, we land in a different point on this loss surface. And what we wanna do is find our way to the bottom of the bowl. 
Um, it's a little hard to see, but this is the minimum of the bowl. And what the gradient literally is, the gradient is a vector that points in the direction of steepest ascent, and the negative gradient points in the direction of steepest descent. So what we're doing is, this was the direction the gradient pointed at the first step. We multiply it by a learning rate, we take a hop, we get the gradient again, we take a hop, 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 and this is what gradient descent is doing. And in linear regression, we have this bowl, which has a local minimum. Neural networks, the loss landscape is much more complicated. Instead of M and B, we might have millions of parameters, and they don't have local minima that we can find easily like this. But gradient descent works in exactly the same way. And uh, this is really fundamental to deep learning, and it's really cool. Um, and the nice thing about this example is um, it's really low level, and it might take you some time to poke around with it. But uh, if you understand this, you understand the fundamentals of how we train networks. So uh, let me show you one or two more things about Colab, then we'll take five minutes and you can poke around with this, and then we'll move into neural networks. First of all, here's how you reset things. So if things go horribly wrong in Colab, you can restore it, restore it to a clean slate by going runtime reset all, and that will delete any files that you've uploaded. It will uninstall any software. It will give you a clean VM. So that's how you get it back to a clean slate. Other really cool things about Collaboratory, if you'd like to get a GPU, which you don't need, it's hidden in notebook settings. So you go to Edit, Notebook Settings, GPU. Don't use TPUs. Um, they'll work, but you need a lot of code changes. GPUs will just work out of the box. Then hit Save, and you'll have a GPU. And another really awesome feature um, is hidden inside the Table of Contents menu. So if you go to View, and then Table of Contents, I don't actually care about the Table of Contents but I care about code snippets. So if you'd like to know how to install software in Colab, you can search for install, and you'll, you'll find out what you need. Likewise, if you want to upload files from your local machine to the VM, there's a file browser. And you should know that any file you upload could get deleted. Uh, the VM resets in about a, I'll slow down, thank you. So the virtual machine resets uh, every day. So don't use this for long-term storage of files. Anyway, um, so I'll stop talking there. Uh, let's take five minutes and just work through that. And the goal is just to start up Colab, connect to a VM, uh, try the example, see if you can train the best fit line. If you'd like to understand what the gradients are, you can print out the gradients that we calculate and just actually take a look at them. And then after that, we'll start on TensorFlow. And if you have any questions, just, just raise your hand and we'll come around and help. Okay, so I'll start again. So, a couple of questions that we got uh, while people were working on it, and you can continue going through it at home. I just want to power through so we can get to some cool stuff. Just so you know, by default, Colab has TensorFlow version 1 already installed. It also has other great libraries like PyTorch and Scikit-Learn. It's not just for, for TensorFlow. After we install TensorFlow 2, sometimes you have to do runtime, restart and that will reconnect to the Python interpreter, and then TensorFlow 2 will start working. So if you're getting errors after you install TensorFlow 2, do runtime restart. Other things you can do are edit, clear all output, which is off, off my screen, but at the bottom you can clear all the output, which is nice. Um, anyway, stuff like that. Also, other things that came up, you can get out of Collaboratory anytime. Um, you can download your Collaboratory file as a Jupyter Notebook or a Python file. If you get tired of Colab, there's no lock-in. You can just escape and move on, move on with life. All right. So that's very, very low level. Okay, so now I want to explain what a deep learning library is. So what's TensorFlow? What problems is it trying to solve? And most of this applies to other deep learning libraries as well, like Chainer, PyTorch, MXNet, CNTK. They all have a similar goal. And because this is SciPy, the first thing that we should ask is, why is Python the most popular language for scientific computing? And just to move quickly through this, um, let's start with reasons why it wouldn't be a good language for scientific computing. And by scientific computing, I mean, let's say I'm, I'm trying to predict the weather using classical techniques, no machine learning. Part of weather forecasting is I need to multiply very large matrices. And Python is very, very slow for this. So does anyone know ballpark about how much slower is Python than C? Just ballpark for multiplying matrices. About 100 times, and your mileage may vary. And so if multiplying a matrix takes six seconds in C, it might take you 10 minutes in Python. 
And this is a huge difference. That's also the same speed difference between running on a treadmill and flying in an airplane. So why is Python still so popular for scientific computing? What makes Python amazing? Everything? Yeah, it's my favorite. It's easy to write. It's easy to write, yes, which is key, because we always care way more about our time than the computer's time, for sure. So it's easy to write, and what else? Because this is SciPy, there's a very special library that makes Python fast. That library is NumPy. NumPy is a matrix multiplier written in C that you can call from Python. And this gives you the best of both worlds. TensorFlow and other deep learning libraries are very similar. The idea with TensorFlow is this. TensorFlow 2 is basically NumPy. It's a C++ backend that accelerates your Python code. There's other things it does too. One such thing is it uses GPUs. You can multiply matrices even faster on GPUs. So you can think of TensorFlow as NumPy plus GPU. And if we were doing a deep learning class and we had time to go into what's inside dense layers, you'd see that most neural networks, when you make a prediction, you're literally multiplying a matrix of weights and inputs. Another thing that TensorFlow does is exactly what you saw in linear regression. To train our models, we need the gradients of the loss with respect to the weights. Which direction should we wiggle M and B? And TensorFlow gives you that automatically with autodiff. And then the other part of TensorFlow that we'll see next is a whole bunch of utilities that help you write neural networks. And you'll see the networks are composed of layers and it's a software library for this. Another thing that's really interesting about TensorFlow is we wanna do stuff like this too. So Python is wonderful, but the problem is Python doesn't run everywhere. So to execute our Python programs, we need a Python interpreter. And what we're doing here, something horrible will probably happen, but I'm gonna try and point my laptop at y'all. Carefully. So, isn't that cool? So what we're looking at, this is something called PoseNet. It's running only client side, so no data is being sent to the cloud. It's running in real time, and it's running in my web browser. My web browser does not have a Python interpreter, but this program was written in Python. What we do in TensorFlow, this is called TensorFlow.js. This is TensorFlow running in JavaScript. The way we do this, or one way this could be done, we need an intermediate format to represent our programs. So even though we're writing it in Python, we need to represent it as something else. And in TensorFlow, one way we can do that is with a graph. So behind the scenes, TensorFlow can represent your programs as a computational graph. And that graph can be run on Android or iOS or in the web. And I don't wanna go into too much detail, but we save your programs into an intermediate format. So basically, after TensorFlow 2 is installed, you can use it a lot like NumPy. And the syntax is a little different, but the idea is the same. And TensorFlow tensors are a slightly different data type than NumPy ND arrays. But the idea is very similar, and what's cool is um, TensorFlow tensors have this nice NumPy method. So if you're uh, having trouble with this data type, or you uh, have existing code that you need compatibility with, anytime you have a TF tensor, which is basically just like a NumPy array, except it can be run on a GPU, you can just do not dot .numpy, and you're back into NumPy land. So this is great. Okay, so that's, that's like the, the boring part. Um, so let's look at some very simple neural networks. And what's great about TensorFlow 2 is it has code styles for beginners and code styles for experts. And what's very important is in truth, the beginner style is good for 90% of all of deep learning, including almost everything you would do in industry. So although we call it for beginners, the easy way is also usually the right way, which is very good news. And I'll explain a lot about this. What we're looking at here is this is the complete code for some neural network. And there's a couple things to notice. The first is deep learning has a lot of concepts, but there's not a lot of code. So when you're learning about deep learning, one thing you have to learn about is, you know, what's the optimizer and what is Atom? And that's, that's one type of gradient descent optimizer similar to how we trained our linear regression model. In linear regression, we use squared error for the loss function. 
this network is doing classification. As it happens, the loss function is sparse categorical cross entropy, which sounds really fancy. But the good news is there's a small box of different loss functions you can use. There's only three or four. And over time, you learn which loss function to use for which problem. So because the code is short, you can focus on the concepts you need to learn. Anyway, in this neural network, we're defining the network and we're compiling it. When we compile it, TensorFlow helps you out. It runs compatibility checks. It makes sure your layers are compatible. And this way, if you have a bug in your network design, you catch it right here, which is really valuable. That means if you can compile your network, your code will run, and it means the bugs you get are going to be machine learning bugs. You know, maybe you didn't use the right number of layers, but they're usually not programming bugs. And this is really, really valuable. This style of code actually existed in TensorFlow 1, and here's how it looks in TensorFlow 2. So in this beginner style, there's no changes. And the expert style that I'll show you is very different. Uh, the difference is in TensorFlow 2, this is the standard. And I'll explain, if you've used deep learning before, you'll see the word keras all over the place, and I'll explain what that is in a moment. Just kidding, I'll explain what that is now. So this is a little complicated if you're new to the space. Deep learning is a new field, and the right way to write a deep learning library is unknown. So people are trying lots of different ideas. One of my favorite all-time libraries is called Keras. And if you go to keras.io, this is a deep learning library called Keras. Totally independent, separate from TensorFlow. This is an open source project, just like TensorFlow. What Keras is, it's really interesting. Keras is what we call an API spec. What I mean by that, it's a specification. It says that, hey, there's different ways to define your deep learning models. This model is called sequential. It's going to be a stack of layers. And Keras says there's different types of layers. One such layer is dense. And here's how you write a dense layer. But Keras doesn't actually know how to do the computation. It doesn't actually know how to multiply matrices. And it doesn't know how to use GPUs. So if you do, pip install Keras, behind the scenes, Keras will install TensorFlow. And it hides TensorFlow from you entirely. And when you write these layers, it uses TensorFlow to do the math. That's one way to use Keras. And that's what you get if you do pip install TensorFlow. I'm sorry, pip install Keras, and then you do import Keras. And that gives you what we call the reference implementation. In TensorFlow 2, we loved Keras so much that it's also built into TensorFlow. And so if you just pip install TensorFlow, you don't need to separately install Keras. You can say, from TensorFlow, import Keras. And you get all the Keras layers. They're just automatically built in. And this is what we'll use to define our neural networks. All right, so let's, let's see how this beginner style works. And the beginner style is exactly the same as what you'd find on keras.io. So we're going to look at MNIST. I know these uh, links are a little bit messed up, by the way. We changed the order of the exercises. So we started with one, and now we'll go to four. Um, but if you bring up this URL, this will give you the complete code for training a neural network to recognize uh, pictures of clothing. So let me explain what's happening in this notebook. Actually, before we do this, let me, let me show you a demo of what deep learning does. And the problem with the demo, this is not intended to be a whole lesson. Like, nobody's going to look at the demo and be like, oh, I understand now what neural networks are and how they work. But I just want to show you briefly what a neural network is doing. And you can try this, too. You can follow along if you like. There's a URL if you go to playground.tensorflow.org. And let me just project this for you really quick. So you can try this. So let's, let's do this first, and then we'll go into the tutorial. So try and bring up this URL. It's cool. So playground.tensorflow.org. And let me show you how a neural network works. 
On the right, we have a data set. In linear regression, uh, this is, this, let's just pretend this is very similar to linear regression. Our goal here is we have some orange points and some blue points. And what we'd like to do is find a line to separate the data. Here we're doing classification. If I hit play, this is a neural network running in the browser. TensorFlow has found the separating line. The way this works, the, these are our input features. This is gonna be very fast, but it's cool, so I just wanna walk through it. These are our input features, the X and Y coordinate, and what we're looking at here is a single neuron in a neural network. The word neuron, by the way, is incorrect. What a neuron really is, it's a logistic regression unit. So a neuron, if you've taken a stats class, is basically logistic regression, and one neuron is a classifier. And a neuron is a linear classifier because it's taking a linear combination of the weights and inputs, which you could learn about in a class, but it's also linear because it's basically drawing this line. And so, as you might guess, you can use linear classifiers to separate linear data. But if we have a nonlinear data set like this, there's no way to draw a line to separate the blue dots from the orange dots. Outside of deep learning, if you take a machine learning class, you learn about feature engineering. And what you can do, there's a way to separate the blue dots from the orange dots using a linear model. There's no way to know this in advance, but what you would learn is something like this. If you look at the data, you might say, I know that all of the yellow dots, different colors here, are closer to the origin, and all the red dots are farther away. So I can add a new feature, z, and z is gonna be x squared plus y squared. And what's interesting is, in this new space z, all the red points will be far away from the yellow points. If you do that transformation, this is what it looks like. And now you see in this three-dimensional space, you can draw a line to separate the points. And we can do that in TensorFlow Playground. This still isn't using deep learning yet. We will do some feature engineering. So we'll provide the x and y coordinates squared, and now our linear classifier can find that separating line, which is really cool. The problem is, when we're working with higher dimensional data like pictures, we can't do this feature engineering. However, neural networks can do it automatically. If we add a hidden layer to the network, and each of these is a neuron, and they're just doing logistic regression, each of them is a little classifier, if we add a hidden layer to the network, it automatically figures out that x squared and y squared are good features. So it's done the hard work for us, and now with our simple inputs, which could just be the pixel coordinates, it can separate the data. What we're looking at here, this is called a dense layer. In the dense layer, there's a certain number of neurons, and here we happen to have eight. The more neurons you have in the layer, the more patterns your network can learn. If we wanted to make this a deep neural network, we could add a second hidden layer. And now we have a deep neural network. And you can use these things to find very sophisticated patterns. So here's a data set, and this might take a while to train, but eventually it will learn how to separate, it will learn the spiral too. So deep neural networks or deep learning are basically doing feature engineering for you, which is incredibly powerful. Um, and that's just a lightning thing of what, what deep learning is doing. So with that, uh, let's, let's start on our MNIST example. So if you bring up bit.ly slash tf dash ws4, you will find your way into this notebook. Actually, this is a tutorial on tensorflow.org. And I wanna show you something important. If at home you wanna learn TensorFlow, all of the tutorials for TensorFlow 2 are on tensorflow.org slash alpha. I know this is very small on the screen, but tensorflow.org slash alpha will bring you here. You should ignore everything else on the website. If it's not under this alpha folder, just skip it. And when we finish alpha, we'll get rid of all the other stuff. And the link from the slides is going to take you here, machine learning basics classify images. And if you click and run in Google Colab, it will open up this notebook and you can run it. I'll walk through this for two minutes and then I'll stop talking and we'll take 10 minutes and you can work on this. Oops. All right. So this is our training data. 
And each of these little squares is an individual example. And all the examples here are little pictures of clothing. And they're uh, grayscale images, they're 28 by 28 pixels. And our goal is to use this data, they're in 10 classes, dresses, shoes, boots, whatever. And our goal is to use this data to train an image classifier that we can classify new data with. Um, I should have asked this before, by the way, I'm sorry. Could you raise your hand if you've taken a machine learning class of any kind, half? Okay. Um, I'm just gonna say two things about machine learning. Here's the basic idea. Machine learning is a game. And here's how the game works. There's always two data sets. There's your training data set, and these are the images that you're given. And then there's your test data set, and these are images you've never seen before. The way it works, this is a lot like going to a casino. And let's say the casino is owned by your friend Rachel. Rachel has all of the data, and she gives you only the training data, and you can do whatever you want with the training data, and your job is to learn a model that you can use to accurately classify images. When you finish training your model, and you can build it however you want, you give it to Rachel. Rachel uses your model to classify her images, the test data. The higher your accuracy on Rachel's data, the more money you get. But the challenge is you never get to see these when you're developing your model. And so what we want, if we just had the training data, the data we have, one way to build a 100% accurate model is we just stick it all in a Python dictionary because we know the labels. So if you give me like this image, image 400, I would just look up that image in my dictionary and I'd say it's a shirt. But that model would have no accuracy on Rachel's data because it's not in our dictionary. We've never seen it before. So we need to find patterns in the data that we can apply to unseen examples. And that's what a neural network is doing. And what this network does, or what this notebook does, most of machine learning is understanding the format of your data. It's data wrangling. This is a famous data set, so it's built into TensorFlow. We download the data set, and this notebook very slowly walks you through understanding the format. So what's the shape of your data? How many examples? And here you'll see this is gonna be 60,000 by 28 by 28. There's 60,000 examples that have 28 uh, rows, 28 columns. And we poke around with the format of the images and the labels. We learn how to display images, and that takes a lot of work. But here's our complete network. So this is the total of the code for the neural network to classify these images. And I wanna show you something else that's really cool here too. I mentioned dense layers. Let me delete that. Now we have what's called a linear classifier. So this is multi-class logistic regression. If I wanna make a neural network, now it's a neural network. If I wanna make a deep neural network, now it's a deep neural network. If I wanna make a deeper neural network, I just keep copying and pasting. This part of deep learning is where you need to understand things like what the heck is a dense layer, what's Rayleigh, what's softmax. But the point I wanna make is this is trivial. This is the smallest, smallest part of machine learning in practice. It takes the longest to learn, but it's also the least important. The most important thing in deep learning and machine learning in general is setting up your experiments, understanding the data set, how do you evaluate if it's accurate. But this is what we have to poke around with. Um, so there we define our model, we compile it, and in this style we can train it with a single line. And then we can evaluate how accurate it is. This is where we're pretending that we're Rachel now, and we're seeing how accurate our model is on, on our data. So why don't you take 10 minutes and, and work through this code, and I'll start again at, at 10.02. And just so you know, each of these, these dense layers, if this was dense eight, for what it's worth, that dense eight corresponds to a layer like this. It's a dense layer. Anyway, I wanna give a couple points about this notebook. When you're writing these uh, networks, the design of your model will influence the accuracy. And typically, the more layers you have, and the more units per layer, the more patterns your model can learn. But larger networks are also more likely to memorize your training data instead of generalizing to test data. Um, I wanna take a moment here and actually talk about a different type of neural network. The problem with dense layers 
is when we look at dense layers, they're very unintuitive. Like, yeah, I can be like, oh, yeah, a dense layer is like logistic regression, but what does that mean? Um, so I just wanted to take just 10 minutes and give you some slides that introduce a different type of layer, which is a little bit more intuitive, that we use to process images. And that layer is called convolution. And so this is a bit of a jump, but I think it will be interesting. So I want to talk briefly about convolutional neural networks. And because this is SciPy, we're going to use some code from SciPy. So let's, let's talk briefly about convolution. And this is independent of TensorFlow. You'll hear the word convolutional neural networks a lot. The best place to start with convolutional neural networks is understanding what convolution is. And if we import SciPy, awesome conference, awesome library, we'll use a built-in image of an astronaut and we will convolve over this image to find the edges. And I'll explain what that means in a sec. For starters, we're importing an image. So my first question for you is, who is this person? And she's famous enough to be built into SciPy. Um, in case no one knows, this is Eileen Collins, and she was the first woman to command the space shuttle Columbia. So anyway, she's built into SciPy, and what we'll do with Eileen is we will detect edges on this image. And we'll do that using convolution. And what's cool about convolution is if you've ever used Photoshop to find edges or to sharpen an image or to blur an image, you've used convolution. This is how we do it. And this is what's called a kernel or a filter. It's a matrix of weights. And in deep learning, we would automatically find this matrix of weights in the same way we found values for M and B. In a convolutional network, we'd be finding values for these weights. This is a weight matrix I wrote by hand, and we can use it to detect images on a lean. The way we do that is we slide this weight matrix over the image, and we take the dot product of the filter and the pixels below it. What that means is it would be negative one times the pixel value below that negative one, plus negative one times the pixel value below it, plus negative one plus negative one, plus eight times the pixel value. The reason that we can use this to find edges, if all the pixels are the same color, the dot product will be zero. But if the pixels here have a very different value than the pixels here, the dot product will be very high. Which is really amazing if you think about it. And let me show you a quick example of how that works and then I'll explain why it's amazing. So here's an example of convolve. And in deep learning, we take terms that sound fancy, like convolution, and we simplify them. So by convolve, we just mean slide. So we put the filter in the up left corner of the image, we take the dot product, that gives us an output value. We convolve or we slide it. One step to the right, we get another output value. It's convolve, convolve, we have an output image with that filter. The reason this is very powerful is with just nine weights, we can find all the edges on a picture. So this is a very, very efficient way of doing deep learning. And you'll see that in TensorFlow, there are layers called convolutional layers. And they do exactly this. They slide over an image, and they learn to detect features. Um, here's some uh, diagrams that I stole from a friend of mine at Google, uh, Martin Gorner, who are absolutely beautiful. And I want to show you how you can convolve over images. And so when we think of an image in Fashion MNIST, in the tutorial you're running, the images are black and white. So they're one dimension. Or, they're, they're 2D images, they're black and white. But a color picture actually has three dimensions or three color channels. So here's an RGB image, red, green, and blue. And in the last example, I showed you that we can convolve over a 2D image, but we can also convolve over a 3D image. And so here, the matrix of weights we might learn is three-dimensional. A 2D matrix of weights, I just showed you can detect edges, this can detect much more sophisticated features. And they're hard to think about for us in three dimensions, but the network will learn them just the same. And when we convolve over a 3D image, just flying through this, we produce a new output image. So this might be the edges. With another weight matrix, we can produce another output image, and so on and so on. So this would be a convolutional layer. Instead of saying dense four, this would be a conv2d layer, four. And that four would tell it to learn four filters. And what's cool is if we arrange this into a hierarchy, 
So you've seen that deep neural networks have layers. If we have a single convolutional layer, these filters will learn features of the pixels. So this guy might learn to detect edges. This might be, I don't know, a different type of edges. But if we have a second layer, we're learning features of features. So the next convolutional layer, features of edges could be shapes. The next layer is going to learn features of shapes, and that could be textures. And if we have 50 layers, eventually layer 40 or whatever might be learning to recognize really sophisticated patterns like eyes or certain types of uh, petals on flowers. And so the reason that deep neural networks work so well is they learn a hierarchy of features that get increasingly abstract as you go down the network. The reason I'm mentioning convolution is convolution is the type of network we would typically use to classify images. In the fashion MNIST example, you'll notice that convolution works with 2D images. In fashion MNIST, we're simplifying this. In the code you just looked at, you'll notice we're using dense layers. Dense layers work with an array of input, and it's one dimensional. We use this flatten layer, and what that does is it unrolls the pixel in the it unrolls the pixels in the images. So it takes an image and it unstacks the rows, and it, exactly, it lines it up into a really long array. And we have to have it in an array format so the dense layers can work on it. The reason I'm mentioning this is uh, a big part of deep learning, if you like NumPy, this is gonna be fun for you. Uh, if for some reason you really enjoy playing with shapes, a lot of deep learning is getting your data into the right shape. And the way we do that here is we just flatten it. When we flatten an image, we lose a lot of information because it's important to know how the pixels are related and what's near what. But for simple images like MNIST, this is fine and we can still train a pretty accurate model. With more complicated images, you wouldn't want to do this. And so uh, there's, yeah, basically the goal of this is just to give you a flavor of some of the different types of layers that exist. Okay, so I want to show you some stuff that's briefly that's new in TensorFlow 2. And maybe we'll try this before the break, or maybe we'll try it after. So this is new in TensorFlow 2. And this is a different way to define your model. And I don't want to talk about machine learning here, I just want to talk about software development. This way of defining your model feels a lot like object-oriented NumPy. There's a couple different libraries that have a very similar style. Uh, Chainer, PyTorch, and TensorFlow, and they all work in a very similar way. The way you write your model is you extend a class given by the library, and they're called slightly different things, but here we call it model. And then you've got two things you can do. You have a constructor, and in the constructor you define your layers. And you have a call method, and in the call method you write the forward pass. And so uh, this is basically synonymous for predict. When you use this model to make a prediction, if this was an image, it would be passed through this method. And then this is the output of the image after it goes through the first dense layer. And what's really cool about this is this is awesome for research. So what we happen to be getting here are the activations. And if I wanted to write a new activation function or try a new idea, I could just write it in regular plain old Python directly in the forward method, or in the call method, excuse me. And so this is a really awesome style for research. It gives you a lot of power. But there's a really interesting programming difference between this style and the previous one. So I mentioned briefly, when you write your code like this in the beginner style, we have this really nice compile method. And what that means is when you compile it, TensorFlow checks to see if your layers are compatible. The reason it can do that is behind the scenes, what we're really doing is we're building a graph of layers. And this is the simplest graph, it's just a stack. There's other APIs in Keras called functional where you can really build graphs. But because we have a data structure, we can run compatibility checks to make sure your code is okay. This is huge and it's not obvious. If we write our code in this style, this is really awesome and fun to write, we don't have a data structure. Your model is just Python bytecode. This means there's nothing TensorFlow can do to help you debug it. I mean, we can show you where the errors are using the Python stack trace, but when you write your code in this style, you get programming errors. And so basically, when I'm debugging code in class, 
if a student, if she writes her code using the sequential model, I can look at it and within five seconds, I can be like, there's the bug. When someone writes their code this way, it can take me 10 or 15 minutes to find the bugs because everyone writes their code differently. There's no convention here. And this is really powerful, but it comes at a cost. And the reason I'm mentioning that is when you're writing code in industry, there's this phrase called technical debt or tech debt. And the problem with using this type of code in a production setting is it's much harder to maintain. So it's awesome for research, but uh, there's some trade-offs. And the reason I'm mentioning this is um, uh, these libraries are very new, and the best way to uh, write your code is still being explored. And that's why we have both of these styles in parallel in TensorFlow 2. So you can use the right one for the right job. There's also two ways to train your models in TensorFlow 2. The first way is what you saw in the MNIST example we just looked at, which is model.fit. And this is also the right thing to do 90 plus percent of the time. So the simple way is almost always the best way and the right way, which is really good news. What we did in the linear regression example because we didn't really have a model, I just created some variables. We wrote it the researchy way. This is the code that's underneath model.fit, and this is what you did in linear regression. We used a gradient tape. The reason you would write this code like this is if you were doing research. So I have a friend at school, her name is Sarah, and she works on different types of activation functions. And there's a bunch of common activation functions. There's things like sigmoid and ReLU and whatever. Let's say that Sarah was writing the Sarah activation function. It's extremely easy because this is regular Python for her to just write some Python to modify the results of whatever her code is. Or if she was working on the Sarah gradient descent optimizer to replace this optimizer, it's just regular Python and she can code it up very easily. So the style is awesome for research. It's, it's great. Um, I don't want to talk about that. Oh yeah, we are going to talk about this. Uh, so one more slide, then we're going to do an exercise, then we're going to take a break. Um, so this, this is an FYI. It's a cool thing, but it comes with a caveat. Uh, one thing you need to do in deep learning is we're often plotting our accuracy. We're plotting our loss. The best way to do that, in my opinion, is to use matplotlib. It's great. It's simple. We have a really awesome, very powerful, sophisticated tool called TensorBoard, which runs inside Jupyter Notebooks. It's beautiful, but it's a little bit complicated. And TensorBoard can help you produce simple plots of your loss over time, and it can produce plots of your networks, and it can do beautiful things like plot gradient histograms and stuff like that. But it takes a lot of setup to use compared to matplotlib. But anyway, for our next exercise, I want you to try the expert style, and instead of just giving you a tiny amount of code, I figured we could use the TensorBoard example. So let's do this now. If you go to this URL, this will bring up MNIST again. This time it's written using model subclassing and a gradient tape in our expert style. And just for fun, it's also going to use TensorBoard. And the big new feature of TensorBoard, it used to be a separate program you had to install, and now you can run it right inside Jupyter Notebooks, which is great. So basically, This URL will take you here. There's a shortcut, by the way, for stuff like this. You can do runtime run all. By the way, if this notebook crashes, there's a difference here. The way this is written, they're installing the nightly branch of TensorFlow 2, and this can be buggy. If you get a crash somewhere later in this notebook, what you should do is replace this line with the ones from the previous notebook that show you how to install a fixed version that we know is bug-free, or less buggy. Uh, where'd it go? I'll show you how this looks after it runs, but it's cool. Uh, just in case people are having trouble with the TensorBoard notebook, what I really want you to see is not TensorBoard. That was just to make it more exciting. I want you to see the expert style. And if you go to tensorflow.org slash alpha, there's another notebook which I'm sure will work. Tensorflow.org slash alpha. Click on Get Started for Experts. Get Started for Experts is a very short notebook 
which shows you how to write code in this style. The important thing is just to be able to see this style and to be able to see how you can use this gradient descent training loop. Just if you want to poke around with it. And I'll try and fix the TensorBoard notebook right now. Let me just see what's happening because a lot of people are hitting the same bug. Yeah, there's something wrong there. So no worries. The main thing is to see the subclassing style. So basically what you want to just take a quick look at. that. Okay, so we have, we have a break um, until I don't know when, but <laughs> sorry. I'll start again, how about at 1045? And at 1045, Amit will walk through structured data, which is really cool. This is basically classifying CSV files, which is critically, critically, critically important in industry. It's like the number one thing. And then after that, uh, I'll walk through a bunch of advanced code uh, for things like Deep Dream and then machine translation. And what's really cool about Deep Dream, although it's very complicated, the code looks almost identical to linear regression, surprisingly, which is gonna be awesome. So I'll start again at 1045, and if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be here happy to help. Okay, so let's get started again. So Amit's gonna talk about structured data in just one sec. And I, I wanna just point out two things before we get started. So first of all, because he's a really awesome engineer, he has fixed the TensorBoard notebook for us. And so I will share these slides afterwards so you have the syntax, but he's given us the code to fix the uh, last notebook, which is awesome, so, so thank you so much. The second thing I wanna say is deep learning is very experimental. So one of the things that you encounter when you're defining your networks is the question, how many layers should I use? What's the right number of layers? And how many units or neurons should I have per layer? And in deep learning, there's no right answer. We don't know the answer in advance. And the way we find out is by running an experiment. And this is much less fancy than it sounds. Literally, I'll pick a starting design, and I know good starting designs from experience. And then I'll experiment by making the networks larger and smaller, and seeing how quickly my model trains and seeing what the accuracy is. This is very different than a lot of machine learning you might learn about if you take a machine learning class that doesn't have the word deep learning in the title. There are many, many, many machine learning algorithms, way more than you see here. And what's nice is a lot of these are much older and they're very well understood. So for instance, if you use a random forest, there's very few parameters you have to set. Usually when you're using a random forest, you just need to say how many trees are in the forest and typically larger numbers are better, and you don't break anything if you use too many trees. Your model just trains slower. Deep learning, we don't have these canned models. Unfortunately, right now, because the field is new, typically we have to design our own model as we go, and that's why you see us specifying the model in terms of the number of layers and stuff like that. So it's just, it's just where the field is today. 
Okay, so with that, uh, Amit's gonna talk about structured data. Hi everyone. Um, if I'm talking too quickly, please uh, you know, just raise your hand. So my name is Amit. I'm from the TensorFlow Developer Infrastructure Team, so uh, back in Mountain View. And um, <clears throat> today I'm gonna talk to you about structured data. And just before we get started, I kind of want to gauge the audience a little, a little bit. Um, how many of you have done machine learning before? Like, you know, trained a model um, on something, even as simple as MNIST. Okay. And how many of you are really new to machine learning? So like, you don't know what a training set is or a test set is. Um, like, anyone who's like, this is their first foray into machine learning? Okay, so um, I'll try and cater the talk to uh, the majority of the audience. So let's get started. So building a model is a multi-stage process. Uh, you start with your data, you know, you uh, create a data set uh, out of your data, and then you create your model, and you have your data configuration layer. You define your architecture of the model. So how many you know hidden layers? How many weights in each hidden layer? what activation function you want to use. And then you're going to decide which optimizer you want to use, how to calculate your loss function, which is basically how you know, um, accurate your, it's a, a way to measure how accurate the model is on trying to do whatever you want the, machine, uh, the, um, the, the model to be doing. And then you uh, will go on to training and validation. And then one step that I don't think Josh had mentioned before is uh, saving the model. So for example, let's say you, know, you save the model, you wanna deploy it to uh, you know, your website or in production, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So we're gonna be doing this in Python, but as Josh mentioned, uh, TensorFlow also has great uh, support for JavaScript and Swift as well is coming soon. Uh, if you're uh, you know, into iOS development or just general app development, which is, Swift, Swift is uh, offering the speed uh, that Python cannot provide with the same really clean API interface. So one of my favorite things about machine learning or one of my favorite applications about machine learning is in the healthcare space. So uh, this is a picture of the, the, of the human retina. And you know earlier, uh, if you wanted to get a diagnosis for diabetic ret retinopathy, which is a disease um, which I think eventually leads to blindness, you needed to go see a specialized doctor for this. But we've actually found that using machine learning and basic convolutional neural networks, you can actually get the same results and same accuracy when predicting whether or not someone has this disease uh, that an actual doctor can provide or close to it. And this is a game changer for you know, uh, people in third world countries as well uh, because they might not have access to the appropriate doctors, but this is you know, deployable anywhere. The same thing goes for skin cancer. We now have a, we, there's, there are researchers working on an application that you just take a picture of you know, a bump on your skin. And it can tell you with a fairly uh, high degree of certainty whether or not it's a cancer, cancerous melanoma. And you can do this stuff using TensorFlow. And to show you, so in line with that, the example we're gonna walk through today is the uh, heart, is predicting whether or not someone has heart disease. So it's what we call a binary classification problem. So zero represents you know, you're a healthy human being. One represents, unfortunately, you have heart disease. And in this example, I've, I've made this data set and modified it from the uh, Cleveland VA Medical Center in the U United States. So if you have seen this before, that's, that's why. And the features we're gonna have in our data set are we're gonna have stuff like age, blood pressure results, cholesterol levels, we're gonna have gender, the EKG testing results, and we're also gonna have a string feature, uh, which is the result of a thallium heart scan. Now, I'm just explaining these features to you out of curiosity, but uh, don't stress too much if you don't know the exact definitions or what each feature entails as I talk about them. So uh, here's a slide uh, of our features explained. Uh, some of them, like our fasting blood sugar, we actually are, are using a categorical version of it. So what that means is we're not looking at the numerical type of the blood sugar. 
like it's whether it's 105 or 130, we're actually just gonna say if it's greater than 120, we're gonna use one. If it's less than 120, we're gonna use zero. And this is what the data looks like. And now I like showing this slide because a majority of you probably have come to this knowing you have a machine learning problem you wanna tackle. Just so if I can get a quick show of hands, does, is anyone working on a machine learning problem right now um, that involves, you know, like CSV files of data? Yeah, so quite, quite a few of you. And what's great about this is this kind of like humanize, this will humanize, you know, that we're just taking any sort of CSV data and we're gonna be able to create a model out of it. And the guts of this code that we're gonna go in the collab together, you can definitely repurpose for your machine learning models as well. All it, all it is is just changing a few feature columns, which I'll explain in a second, and this model will work or like give you some sort of results for your data as well. So uh, loading the data, it's fairly simple. So the one more thing I wanna mention is that the APIs that you see here aren't exactly the APIs we're gonna be using in the collab. I've simplified them just for the sake of the presentation. So we're just gonna load in the data. Uh, TensorFlow has default classes. So as you, mentioned, as you saw earlier, you can actually specify what data type each object is in your CSV. So this, is an, this one is an integer, this one is an in, like string, this, one, this value is a float. You can uh, match your features based on this. And TF, uh, TensorFlow has a tf.data class or API, which is really powerful. Uh, for those of you who are really familiar with Pythons, it actually uh, creates an iterator, uh, no worries if you don't know what that is, of, of your data set object. And you can actually do really simple calls to do really complicated things. So for example, if you've created this data set object, you can actually just you know, call take and it'll give you back one value. So as you can see, this is just the first row in the data set. And tf.data allows you to randomize, shuffle, and separate your data for you as well. So now we need to parse the data from the CSV. So we're gonna write a real quick function that's gonna basically split it into your features and your label. So that's just like, just like that. And we're also gonna tag it with the column names just so your model knows what it's getting. And like I mentioned before, tf.data tf objects or data set objects can shuffle and map uh, the function that we just wrote across the data. So what this second line is doing is it's basically taking the uh, data set that we have before and creating a new one and creating a new iterator where we apply the function that we just wrote to the entire data set and we're just gonna get a, a batch of whatever size, a smaller size of, that we request of that data set. So I think I had a question earlier that was asking, oh, you know, how do you separate the test and training data or how do you like split it out into smaller ones? TF.data is a great way to do that. And what's great about this newer versions of TensorFlow and TF.Keras is that you can just, uh, you, in TensorFlow 2.0, you can just print the output and you'll be able to debug very simply like if your shape of your vectors or, uh, or the output is exactly what you expect it to be. So where are we in the high, high level process? We've you know, started off with our raw CSV data and we have created a data set object out of it. So now we're gonna go to the fun stuff, which is creating the model. So one really powerful tool that I wanna teach you guys about, excuse me, is feature columns. So as you saw earlier, we had very, very different types of features and we need to basically explain to the model what these features mean, right? So for example, when you look at age and I tell you zero is female, one is male, you understand that like implicitly, but we need to basically provide our model that like information as well. And so feature columns are great for doing that. So there are six main types of feature columns, which basically take in your data and actually format it into something the model can understand. Numeric feature columns are pretty simple. You just provide actual values into it. So for example, if age is your feature, you can just provide, it, uh, provide a numerical column for that. But now if you, want, if you have, let's say, you know, years, like 1939, 1947, we don't have it for our example, but if 
you want to bucketize these years into like decades, so 1940s, 1930s, you can use bucketize columns for that. Categorical identity columns are, you know, based on uh, like just like I mentioned before, zero is for female, one is for male. You can actually just provide the uh, categorical identity for that. Categorical vocabulary columns, which we'll use as well, are for you know uh, a, a small subset of strings. So, for example, if you were if your input is countries, you can use uh, categorical categorical vocabulary columns. Hash columns and cross columns are also really interesting. Hash columns are if you have an infinite amount of vocabulary, use hash columns. And cross columns are really cool if you want to do some really hardcore analysis. You can actually cross features. So, for example. You can make age along with gender a particular feature, but we won't be using the, la, the last two in our e example today. So uh, the, as I mentioned, the categorical column with vocabulary, we are going to provide the vocabulary of the thal scan results, which are the output is going to be either normal, fixed, or reversible. So they're just strings. And we're going to feed that into an embedding column. And if you guys are confused about why we need an embedding column or what the feature column is doing, I can explain that uh, afterwards. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'm going to keep going. Uh, so we're going to have the numerical column for stuff like age. And then at the end, we're going to have a list of all the feature columns that we have for each of our features. And now we're going to create a feature layer out of those feature columns. So this is just, you can just add a layer like we did for sequential. Um, this, you can treat it basically like uh, you know, a dense layer. Yeah. And I'll show you that in a second. So like I mentioned before, you just create a sequential model. Your first layer is the feature layer that we've just put together. Then I've just randomly chosen two dense layers of 128, 64. And then the final dense layer is going to be our output layer. And it's only going to have a unit of one. And the activation function is a sigmoid activation function, which will basically tell us uh, from 0 to 1 whether or not someone has heart disease, the probability. So now we're going to choose our optimizer. Uh, I've chosen the atom optimizer, uh, which is a variable rate optimizer. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. But if you want to read up more on optimizers, our documentation is great. You can just literally Google tf.train.atomoptimizer. And it'll give you a list of optimizers that you can use as long as linked to the actual paper about the optimizer. We're going to use the binary cross entropy function. And Keras is great. It allows you to actually list which metrics you care about. So we're going to ca we care about accuracy, obviously. So we're going to plot that as well. So back to the high level scheme of things, we've just you know, created our model. And we are now ready to actually do some training on it. So I've basically created a for loop where we iterate for 20 epochs. And we're just going to call the model.fit call. And here, we're going to provide how many steps per epoch. So we don't have that many training examples. We only have roughly, we, total examples, actually. We only have roughly 300, of which only maybe 200 or so we'll use for actual training. And if you run this, the output looks like this. My training accuracy happened to be 84%. So it's really simple. In just like one or two lines of code, you're training a model uh, for something as important as predicting heart disease. Now we're going to validate our model. So uh, we're going to create our test data set. So my, test, my data set was actually split out into two separate files. but. Once again, you can use other APIs. I think, our, I think the uh, collab that we're going to walk through uses a different API. And we're just going to do very similar stuff, as I mentioned earlier, and call the model.evaluate function, which is going to give us our validation accuracy, which I got pretty lucky. was around 84%. But once again, since we have so few examples, this is not really statistically significant. But yeah, so we've now done training. We've done, like, we have a validation metric as well. And now we're just going to you know, save the model. Let's say you want to export it or send it over. It's really simple. All you have to do is call this function. And it creates a directory where you uh, have you know, your object-based uh, checkpoint file as well as a proto file. 
And if you want to load your model, it's just as simple as you know, calling the load Keras model on that directory that you just created. So it's really easy to send and retrain and keep iterating on models and improve your performance. So that's it. Uh, we started with our raw CSV data, and we have now have an exportable, deployable model. So uh, just a quick conclusion, like to recap, we prototyped with Eager. So Eager execution is actually something that's enabled by default. It, the main difference between TensorFlow earlier and TensorFlow now is earlier, uh, when you printed the output of a TensorFlow command, it would just provide you like some a lot of garbled strings which weren't actually values. With Eager, it actually executes that code immediately. Uh, and then we pre-processed with data sets. We uh, transformed our data with feature columns. We learned how to build with uh, tf.keras, and we've packaged with save model. And a majority of your work is going to involve you know, the last three steps. Like 84% for predicting heart disease is not statistically significant. Like you know, basically every fifth person that walks into your office, you're misdiagnosing him. So you want to keep retraining as much as possible. And you know, improving your validation accuracy and then getting a better model as a result. So now with that, we're just going to walk through that exercise. Um, here's the link for that. And I believe, uh, how much time do we give them? Yeah, so uh, feel free to go walk through that. Uh, take around 10 minutes. One fun exercise I like to do is to see if I can get the uh, training accuracy higher than what it is by default. You know, maybe you can change the model uh, size or you know, do some tricky stuff like I mentioned before. And uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. OK. <clears throat> I'll get started again a little bit early. And we'll share the slides so you can keep working on this stuff at home. Speaking of structured data, there's a really nice tool I'd like to show you. It has nothing to do with TensorFlow. It's just a handy utility. It's called Facets. And the URL is on the slides. But it's a CSV visualizer. The way Facets works is you upload a CSV file. It runs in the web browser. You can upload a file with just load your own data. There's nothing to install. And it helps you visualize it. And as it happens, we're looking at a CSV file from the US Census. So every point is a row in the CSV. And all the features you see are the columns from the CSV file. So this person I've randomly clicked on is my age. He's a high school graduate. He's from the US. You can see how many hours he's, week he's working, his marital status, so different demographic information about him. And what this is really cool is you can use this to understand your data before you start training a classifier. So let's say that we wanted to predict if somebody's making more or less than $50,000 a year. The blue dots here, and there's a column in the CSV for this, the blue dots are the people making less than $50,000 a year, and the red dots are the people making more. And some of the columns, the feature columns that Amit mentioned, like bucketing, you can actually see how they work inside facets. So I want to show you what a bucketing column does. Bucketing means to divide. So let's say I bucket by their education. So now we've divided our data into buckets by education type. And we can see that, for example, if we zoom in here, Professional school, these are people with MDs and JDs. And you can see that most doctors and lawyers in this data set are making more than 50K a year. Whereas if we look here, high school graduates who didn't continue their education are less likely. And this is just a nice way to explore your data and gain intuition for it before you train a model. You can also bucket in facets by two things at once. So if we also bucket by age, we can see that uh, anyway, you can see just how income correlates with age and stuff like that. It's a really nice tool. We could talk about structured data for a while. It's a really great topic, but that's just FYI. Okay, so let's, let's talk about a few fun things. And the goal here is not to understand all of these models. It's just to get a sense for the code that you can try. And we're going to start with Deep Dream, but before I go into Deep Dream, something really important about TensorFlow 2 that I wanted to mention. 
So our documentation is code. So for all of these examples, do you know the expression trust but verify? So I'm going to show you things that look nuts, like the code for image captioning and the machine translation code. But on our tutorials, you have the complete code for all of this. So you can exactly reproduce what I show you. And there's, there's nothing hidden at all, which is really amazing. Um, anyway, I want to talk about Deep Dream. And this is on the research side. So Deep Dream, the input image is on the left. And the output image is on the right. And the code that I'm going to show you is hello, Deep Dream world. It's the simplest example. And it's very, very short. There's fancier versions that will produce beautiful images. But Deep Dream became famous in 2015 for producing psychedelic images. So if you search for Deep Dream images, you'll find crazy stuff like this. Um, there. So this is a picture produced by Deep Dream. And what I wanted to mention, what's really interesting, is the goal of Deep Dream is not to produce psychedelic images. The goal of Deep Dream was to do research into investigating. I mentioned convolutional networks earlier. Image classifiers that we use on a regular basis, they're many convolutional layers deep, and they're trained on very large data sets. And they're very accurate. And one question that researchers asked was, why is it that these models are so accurate at classifying data? And do you remember I showed you filters? Like we learned a filter, or we saw a filter that could detect edges. The CNN learns these filters. And in layer 40 or whatever, there might be a filter that responds to eyes in the image. The question in Deep Dream was, can we visualize exactly what that filter is learning to detect? And it turns out that we can. And uh, normally, when we train an image classifier, what we do, like in linear regression, is we have some variables that we want to adjust to make the loss go down. And we do that using gradient descent. And Deep Dream is the opposite idea. It uses gradient ascent. And instead of adjusting weights to reduce an air function, Deep Dream adjusts the image to increasingly excite a layer in a convolutional neural network, which is an amazing idea. And as it turns out, the code for it is pretty short. The code is very concise. But the idea itself is not something I would have thought about in a million years. But the important takeaway here is once you have the idea and you understand it, um, implementing it is surprisingly concise. And I just want to show you what the code looks like. It's very short. It's almost identical to linear regression. And it shows you the power of deep learning. Like 80% of this notebook is just downloading and pre-processing images. We're going to download some image. I'm sure this could have been written in five lines. I'm not a very good Python developer, so I wrote it. It's very verbose. But this code just downloads an image. There's no machine learning. And that's the image that we've downloaded. And now I want to show you the whole algorithm for Deep Dream. We want to go from this to this. And what we're seeing is there's little faces of sheep appearing in the clouds. What we're doing is we're super saturating this image with sheep everywhere, algorithmically, because it's 2019. So here's 33% of the Deep Dream algorithm. This is one third of it. What we need to do is start with a pre-trained image classifier. In TensorFlow, you can either train your own classifier, or you can import one that's been previously trained. This happens to be, there are many different types of uh, famous models. Inception v3 is one such famous model. It happens to be, it's just a very deep image classifier with many layers. That, Anyway, anyway, we're importing Inception. And we're downloading, instead of training it from scratch, we're importing pre-trained weights. So this model was already trained on a data set from Stanford with a million images and a 1,000 different classes. So it's a general purpose image classifier. But we don't want to use this to classify images. We want to use this to modify an image to increasingly excite a layer. 
if right here, basically, we just said inception v3 dot predict, and we gave it cat dot jpeg, it would probably tell us it's a cat. Uh, if I change this line to true, that would be true. But just take that on faith for now. So it's a pre-trained image classifier. What we're doing here, though, I don't want to use it as a classifier. What I want are the intermediate activations. And so these are some layers from the model that I've picked. And I've picked them because I just happen to know they work well. But you could pick other ones. And I'm making a new model. When I call this model on an image, it's going to give me a list of activations. And that's basically just a number that describes how excited those neurons are from the layers that I've picked. So 33% of the algorithm, algorithm is our forward pass. We take an image. We forward it through the model, which we're doing here. I could have written this in one line. I don't know why I wrote it this way. And we can get the activations back. Now we need our loss function. So in linear regression, let me map this to linear regression. And this part's more complicated, but the rest is not. In linear regression, the way we do predict is y equals mx plus b. Here, the way we do predict is we forward the image through our network, and we get the activations. Maybe that's like the world's worst analogy. Just forget that. Uh, the loss function is interesting. So in linear regression, the loss is our squared error, how far a line was from the points. Here, most of this code is just normalizing, but really the loss is just this one line. The loss is the average activation in that layer. The higher the loss, it means the more strongly our neuron that responds to faces was excited. And so what we want to do is do gradient ascent to actually make this value larger. So we have our loss function, and this is 66% of the algorithm. And now we have our training loop. Um, I probably shouldn't have tried to compare this to linear regression. That was ridiculous. But uh, the code looks very similar. So just like in linear regression, we're iterating for a number of steps. We're using the gradient tape in the same way we used it. This time, we forward the image through the network, get the activations. We calculate the loss, which is the mean activation. And then the magic here is we use TensorFlow, and we say, TensorFlow, please give me the gradient of the loss. Here's the insight. With respect to the pixels on the image. So instead of adjusting weights, we're asking for the gradients with respect to the pixels. This is telling us literally how we should modify the pixels to reduce the loss. So this is telling us how to tweak the image very slightly to make, it more, to make more faces appear. Then what we do is we literally just add those gradients directly to the image. The gradients have the same shape as the image. There's one for every pixel. And then we continuously repeat that. And pretty quickly out will come something like this. And if you run the code, you can see this happening step by step. And the reason I'm showing this to you is not because of the particulars of Deep Dream, but there's this really cool thing in linear regression. I'm sorry, in uh, deep learning, jet lag. If you look at, this is a complicated algorithm. But that's all the code. And deep learning gives us this very powerful tool. Once we have the ideas, once we think of this, which is the hard part, there's not a lot to do to code it up. And so you have to wonder, like, what other amazing things can we do with deep learning in like 12 or 15 lines of code if, if we just think of the right idea? So I find this really fascinating. Um, it's really powerful stuff. Other really cool things, we're going to come back to that exercise later. Other really cool things you can do. This is another Hello World example for image colorization. And by Hello World, I mean I wrote this to run as fast as possible, copying a very good blog post that I linked to from the example. And here what we're doing is we're training a model to colorize an image. So we start with a black and white model, and we learn to color it in. Um, I don't want to say much more about this than just pointing you at the code right now, but the key insight here The entire model for this, all of the machine learning is just that. That's the entire model that can colorize images. And it's written, the things to notice, it's written using the beginner's API that I showed you earlier, which is totally suitable for this problem. It's using convolutional layers, which I briefly mentioned. And it's using one other type of layer, which you could learn about. So deep learning, we have these layer-like building blocks. And we can assemble them in different ways to do really sophisticated things. And that's, that's all the machine learning in this. 
And the other takeaway, it's we train this thing exactly like we trained the model that Amit showed for structured data. We train it exactly like the hello world MNIST example. And so there's a lot of very, very powerful low-hanging fruit. Um, other really cool examples that I'd like to show you. I'm going to start training a model right now, and then I'll explain what it does. So this is hello world for machine translation. And this will also run in about a minute. I'm just going to, it's actually going to take longer to install TensorFlow than it is to train our translation model. And what we're doing here, this notebook will uh, show you how to train a model to translate between sentences in English and sentences in Spanish. And um, I'll come back to this, but I have, I have a question to ask you first. So here's, here's my question. Uh, does anyone speak more than two languages? I'm jealous. So people that are trilingual, I shouldn't be raising my hand. I'm jealous, I'm jealous, I'm jealous, because I'm not. I have high school Spanish, and it's terrible. So here's my question for you. If I asked you to translate a sentence in English to two other languages, say French and German, would you first go from English to an intermediate representation? In your head, do you know what the sentence means, independent of the words, and then go to the target? So would you go from like English to meaning to German? Or do you directly just go from English to German? Does that question make sense? Like basically, do you think about meaning independent of words? No? You go directly from words to words? So you can you can go from so you can go from English to meaning to language. Okay. So the reason the reason I'm asking um, there is this old idea in machine translation. Let's say we want to train a many-to-many -many translator. We want to translate from English and Japanese to French and German. The way we do that is we write one program to map from sentences in English and Japanese to an intermediate representation in logic. And the idea was this logic would capture the meaning of the sentence independent of language. And that was called an interlingual representation. And then given that logic, we would have a second program to generate text to go from logic to German. And this didn't work. Because in retrospect, it's incredibly hard to represent the meaning of language and logic, because there's so many subtleties, right? And so it was thought that an interlingual representation was very hard to get. And it turns out that we can do it very easily in deep learning. And what you could do, well, let me just show you. So this, this notebook has finished running. And I just want to show you what the output looks like. Here was an input sentence in English. Here was the sentence that we wanted to get in our parallel corpus. And here's what our model predicted. So it's already learned a very, very bare bones uh, machine translation model, which is incredible. The way this works is really complicated, but it's a really elegant idea. And I want to describe it to you. And then I'll connect this to interlingual representations. So I don't have slides, uh, but I'll talk through it. And hopefully, you can follow along a little bit. The basic idea is that there are actually here, let me motivate this, because we need to talk about embeddings really quick. All right. Here's the idea of an embedding. And this connects to the idea of deep learning as compression, which is really powerful. Let's say this is a model we're using to classify images. Let's say our image is really big. It has a million pixels. We start feeding it through the model. What's really interesting is the output of this layer, this dense layer, has 512 activations. So we've gone from a million pixels to 512 activations. And the numbers don't matter, but what's important is this number is a lot smaller than a million. What this is forcing the classifier to do is capture all of the information it needs to classify those million pixels in 512 numbers. And again here, 
this layer is summarizing those 512 numbers above it into 128. And as we go through the network, it's compressing the image into an intermediate form. If we wanted to, we could just print out these 128 activations. And that would be something called an embedding. An embedding is a, it's a vector that describes something larger. So basically, this is, it's a little pyramid that's flipped upside down, and it's distilling the information in the image as it goes through, which is this really cool abstract idea. Um, but anyway, the reason that connects to machine translation is the way we do this translation is we train two models in parallel. So instead of one model, we have two. We have something called an encoder. And an encoder, the job of an encoder, is to take an object and produce a vector. So here, the encoder would take a sentence in English and embed it into a vector. And a vector, it's a list of numbers. In this case, we picked 64 numbers, but we could tune that parameter. The vector, it forces the classifier to represent the sentence as a list of numbers. And it has to capture as much of the meaning as it can in that list of numbers. A second neural network called a decoder, it's a decoder, takes only that vector, that list of numbers, and produces text in the target language. So an encoder will go from an English sentence to a list of numbers, and a decoder goes from that list of numbers to a Spanish sentence. To understand how this works, you would have to learn about a different type of layer called an RNN. There's different flavors of RNNs. This one happens to be a GRU. If you've heard of things called LSTMs, we could have written it like that. The important thing to notice here is this looks a little complicated, but the encoder has two layers. And this is all we need to map a sentence into a vector. The decoder also basically has two layers. And this is all we need to map a vector into a sentence. And um, the, the takeaway here is, um, ah, this is super cool. If we wanted to do this for two languages at once to get the interlingual representation, all we would have to do is copy and paste this data set and include French outputs in addition to Spanish. I'm sorry, French inputs in addition to English. And this would force the encoder to learn how to represent sentences from either English or French into a vector. And that vector is an interlingual representation that captures the meaning of a sentence. And the reason I'm talking about this is um, this is super cool. This is called a sequence to sequence model. Super cool, super powerful. But if you were interested in, say, linguistics, there's really interesting work to be done in the intersection of deep learning and other fields. So me, I look at this, I'm a Python developer, and I'm like, awesome, I can train this really cool translation model. But I think the really interesting value in the same way that Deep Dream can help us understand how neural networks can process images, we could look at these embeddings and understand how neural networks can represent language. And so there's a lot of amazing work to be done. Another really cool feature of this notebook is uh, you can train a machine translation model in a minute because it's on a very small data set. I'm going to point you at a couple more cool examples, and then we're just going to try some of these just for fun, because it's ridiculously, uh, it's amazing to me that we can do this. Another reason encoder decoders are so powerful is this. The really interesting thing about this, this is the code, this is an example to caption images. And what you might not expect, this is also an encoder decoder. The decoder was copy and pasted from the machine translation tutorial. The decoder is identical. We literally copy and pasted the model, or I'm sorry, the, the code for the model. The way this works is in translation, we use a layer called an RNN to encode a sentence. Here, we use a layer called a CNN to encode an image. So we modify the encoder to work with images, but this maps an image to a vector, and then we already have a decoder that knows how to take vectors and produce sentences, and we can reuse that. And so um, it, the same idea lets us do this thing that looks fundamentally different, but the code is surprisingly similar. And this model will take a couple hours to train. We don't have a hello world example yet. There's one last really sophisticated uh, type of neural network that I want to talk about, and this is one of the greatest ideas in computer science in the last 
probably 10 years. It's from Ian Goodfellow from 2014. And uh, Ian Goodfellow was a PhD student at the time. And I'll explain what this is in a sec. It's called a generative adversarial network. But does anyone happen to know what was Ian doing when he had this, when this incredible idea came to mind? You're exactly right. Ian was drinking at a bar, and he had this amazing insight. And the reason I'm mentioning this to you is it's important to take a break from your work, because sometimes good ideas will come to you when you're relaxed. A lot of what we do in deep learning is, and machine learning in general is we classify stuff. So when you read the books that I'll point you uh, to at the end of this little workshop, you basically learn the most important skills, classifying structured data, classifying images. We take images and we put it into a bucket. Is this a cat or a dog? What's much harder is generating images. How do we generate pictures of new cats that we've never seen before? The reason this is hard is all of the deep learning models that we've seen have a loss function. To train our image classifier, we need to understand how bad it is. We need a number that we can optimize. To train linear regression, that's the squared error. In an image classifier, it happens to be cross entropy. But if we want to make a new picture of a cat, we need a number that tells us how bad that picture of a cat is. And once we have that number, we're good. In GANs, or generative adversarial network, networks, the idea is we can train two neural networks in parallel. One network is called a generator. The generator's job is to generate an image. And it will start by generating an image of random noise. You can think of it as forging a picture of a cat. The second network is a discriminator. The discriminator's job, you can think of it as a detective, is to look at the picture of the cat that was generated and say, is this real or fake? We know how to train a discriminator because a discriminator is just a binary image classifier. It looks basically like the MNIST example that you looked at, except that's more complicated because it's a multi-class classifier. But it's just an image classifier. So we can train that very easily. Then what we do is we start generating random images with the generator. I don't have slides for this. And we use the gradients. We classify them with the discriminator. And we look at the gradients of the discriminator. So what features of those images did it use to tell that they were fake? And then we use those to adjust the generator so it gets more accurate in the next iteration at generating real images. And uh, I just want to show you some code you can try for this. Uh, we have two really cool tutorials for GANs. The simplest one is called DCGAN. And in DCGAN, here's an animation that this tutorial produces. And what we're looking at is this is the generator learning to produce increasingly real digits over time. And this is the MNIST data set. And I just want to show you briefly, there's just two neural networks that are trained. So there's the code for the generator, which learns to produce pictures. Later, there's the code for the discriminator. And um, you can read through this to see how they're trained in parallel. One thing you should know is this is a pattern that you see in deep learning a lot. So you'll see a paper like GANs in 2014. And then usually what will happen is every six months or so, a PhD student will have like a bigger and better version. So they iterate and refine. And so we have another tutorial for GANs from uh, some students at Berkeley. And it's the same idea. The code's very similar, but it's a larger, more complicated model. And what this model does is it goes from a picture of a facade, and it predicts what the building might look like. And it's super, super beautiful. And this model is called Picks to Picks. It will take longer to train, but all the code for it is on the website. OK, so this is purely for fun. Um, here's a choice. So there's, let's take 10 minutes, and there's, there's two things you can work on. Choose your own adventure. Uh, if you want, here's the code for Deep Dream. And this is minimal Deep Dream, so a mini dream. And the goal of this is you could swap the image to your own image, or if you want, you can understand the shape of the gradients, or just try and look at the algorithm. You could look at the output of using the pre-trained uh, CNN to get the intermediate activations, just for fun. And then if you want, 
Here's also the minimum code you need to train an English to Spanish translation model using an encoder decoder architecture. And with either of these, you could have like multiple lectures from a class and you'd read papers and have homework. These take a long time to understand, but they're awesome. And I think it's worth, uh, just because we started with linear regression, it's worth just seeing uh, what you can do and how little code it takes to do it. So that's minimal NMT, and NMT stands for Neural Machine Translation. Let me put these on the same slide. So let's take 10 minutes and you can play with that. Okay, so some other cool things to be aware of. And this is just some FYI of how TensorFlow works under the hood. So at the start of the talk, I mentioned that TensorFlow is a lot like NumPy, plus GPUs. And the goal is to accelerate Python programs using a C++ backend. And here's another example of something new you can do in TensorFlow 2 to make your Python code run faster. And uh, what we're doing here, here's just some code where we're uh, calling an LSTM. It's one type of layer on some data we're just creating. And we don't care about the output. This is just we're making TensorFlow do some work. And we're going to benchmark how long it takes. And this little benchmark I wrote at the bottom, this is taking a third of a second to run. I'm sorry, three one hundredths of a second to run. And the question is, how can we modify this code to make it faster? And the good news is, this is the only non-standard uh, thing you would have to learn in TensorFlow 2, is we just add one line. And if you look at the before and after, I'm not changing the code at all. I'm just adding an annotation at TF function. And what this does is it tells TensorFlow, hey, I want you to run this code, trace all the execution, optimize it in C++, run it, and then give me the result. So rather than ping-ponging back and forth between Python, C++, Python, C++, this basically compiles your code, runs it in the back end, and gives you the result. And you'll notice, importantly, because we care about our time, you'll notice there's no code changes. I just put this annotation. And the result, this runs about nine times faster with the annotation which is super cool. Um, your mileage will vary dramatically. You don't get this kind of speed up for all of your code. It depends a lot on exactly what the code is. Jet lag, that was like a useless sentence. Depends on what your code is doing. Uh, code with lots of small operations will be accelerated by this. If you're just multiplying two big matrices, probably not. Also, something important to know, this is completely optional. And this is independent from the machine learning work that you might do. But this is a cool thing that exists. Another cool thing that exists is any code that you can put, if you try at TF function and you don't get a crash, any code that you can TF functionize can be exported to a saved model. So if you have Python code, but you'd like to run it on Android, and you can get it into a TF function, that means you can export it to a TensorFlow saved model. And then you can deploy it on different devices which is really, really cool. Um, if you want to see how this works under the hood, again, you never have to do this. This is just FYI. I want to see the code that's generated from TF function. So here's another example. I just wrote some TensorFlow code. And what I wanted to show you here, this looks a lot like NumPy. Instead of NP, I'm just using TF. I at TF functioned it. And I want to see the output of TF function. What it does is it uses something called autograph. This is a source-to-source -source Python transformer. And it emits Python code that the back end can compile and optimize. And here's the code that's generated. You would never write this yourself. But this is what autograph does automatically for you. It basically converts your code to this special format that can be optimized. This is a little bit like assembly language, or it's an intermediate representation. This is totally out of my area. And there's people that are compiler experts that are working on this. But one comment I wanted to make, because this is Python, is um, it feels like we're, we might be starting to run into limitations of the language. So Python is my all-time favorite language, because it's easy to use. But we have this performance issue. 
And now we're in this, I mean, if you look, if you think about the design and engineering work behind this, like what we're doing is we're writing code in Python, and then we have this amazing system called Autograph, where we convert it to a specialized format. Then we send that to a C++ backend, and that thing is gonna compile this and optimize it. Then it's gonna send the result back to Python. This is extremely complicated. And um, it works very well, but this is a very heavy solution. And so right now, there's other efforts to explore doing machine learning also in other languages, like Swift. Um, and that effort's underway, and it's really cool. So what we're seeing right now is Python is by far the most popular language for machine learning, and it will likely remain that way for five, 10 years. But we're seeing a balance start to happen, where now we have things like TensorFlow.js, which is even way slower than Python, but it's important because you can run it in the browser, and we're starting to see efforts in things like Swift because it's a modern compiled language. There's also really strong support for Keras and R. And so we're seeing these other languages uh, gain popularity too, which is really, really good for the deep learning ecosystem. So it's not an all Python world uh, anymore. Some people asked about distributed training, and I wanna show you the design in TensorFlow 2. And the design for distributed training focuses on ease of use, so I'm really happy with this. Here's some code for some Keras model that you've seen before. And here's how we run it on multiple GPUs. So what we're doing is we're adding a distribution strategy. And this is the simplest one. It uses something called data parallelism. It sends batches of data to multiple GPUs on the same machine to train the model faster. The most important thing is there's very few code changes. These are still under development, so this one works now, and the team is working on adding more. Distributed training in deep learning is a whole engineering discipline. And basically the idea is that you have multiple machines with multiple accelerators. How do you take the code for your model and distribute it across these devices? It's a really cool area. But by packaging up these different ways of doing distributed training in these very simple strategies, we make it very easy for the end user. Like from my perspective, I don't care how this works because it's not my area. I just want my code to run faster. And so I'm really, really excited by these really simple, easy to use things that I can just plug and play, importantly, without changing my model. Um, I didn't talk about TensorFlow 1 uh, at all. Um, but basically, let me just show you, ah, here's an important slide I should have. If you're learning TensorFlow, we're in this funny place where we have a lot of tutorials that are written in TensorFlow 1. You should never use those. <laughs> TensorFlow 1 is vastly more complicated and not important to learn. The only thing you should do is learn TensorFlow 2, tensorflow.org slash alpha. Let me show you things that are on the website that you should never use. So if you go to tensorflow.org, get started, you only want this tab. If it's not here, just ignore it. And let me see if I can show you what some of the older code looks like. Uh, some of it is okay, but some of it is not. Um, actually, most of this, this is good code because it's been cleaned up. Um, this is good code, but you still don't wanna learn it. Let me show you very old TensorFlow code. So I showed you linear regression, and you'll notice that TensorFlow 2 worked just like Python. That's not the case in TensorFlow 1. So I mentioned that behind the scenes, TensorFlow is a C++ engine to accelerate graphs. In TensorFlow 2, you never have to write that graph yourself. It's automatic. You don't even have to know it's a thing. In TensorFlow 1, you would manually specify the graph. So you would design a graph and you would run the graph. And this is super powerful. TensorFlow 1, this is exactly what you would want if you were an engineer at a large company like Google and you needed to train the world's largest neural networks. We love graphs because we can distribute them across many machines and accelerate them, right? So they're perfect in computer science, but they're hard to develop with. In TensorFlow 1, this is the code for linear regression. 
you would use things like placeholders. And a placeholder was a way of feeding data into the graph. So you would feed your, you know, we're doing y equals mx plus b. You have to feed in your x's. So we're feeding in the x's, and we're feeding in the y's that we should have gotten. Um, uh, in order to actually get code out of the graph, we had to use things like session.run. And session.run means go into the graph and evaluate this value and get it back. This code is good. I mean, maybe I'm teasing it a little bit too much. Um, but it's, it's much more complicated than TensorFlow 2. So the way to avoid code like this, if you see any tutorials with any of these words, you should skip them. If you see session.run in the tutorial, just skip it. It's out of date. If you see placeholder, you should skip it. It's out of date. And if you see this funny phrase, enable eager execution, you should skip it. Just move on. This was a really cool thing, by the way. So the way it works with semantic versioning, TensorFlow 1 actually got much, much easier to use about a year ago. And we made TensorFlow 1 work like TensorFlow 2 with this line of code here. It's because you can't have backward incompatible changes in a, in a framework. We had to wait for TensorFlow 2 before we could fix everything. But this was a, this was a bit of a patch. But anyway, that just means it's an old tutorial. Uh, I know this is SciPy, but uh, I wanted to briefly talk about TensorFlow.js. And the reason I like talking about this is this is something I was super wrong about. So when I heard this idea, the idea was, hey, we'd like to develop deep learning in JavaScript. You know, I've spent a lot of time talking about how Python is slow and this is a problem. And I'm a back-end developer. So when I heard JavaScript, I'm like, this is horrible. It's, it's going to be, we're going to have all these problems all over again. Anyone who's a web developer immediately thought this was an awesome idea for reasons I didn't know. And because this is SciPy, I assume some of you have the same background that I do. Things that are obvious to web developers. If you have a program in a web browser, from a user's perspective, they don't need to download anything. They just go to a URL, and your program is there. Also, <laughs> because there's no server involved, there's no REST APIs, computation happens locally. That means you have access to cameras. And if you think about another thing which I didn't understand, when I think about phones, I think about writing programs in Android but web browsers run on phones too. So if you write your code in JavaScript, users can use it on a desktop, laptop, or phone, which is a really big deal. And then uh, people immediately become converts when they see these demos. Like seeing interactive ML in the browser is just so powerful and compelling. It's really, really cool. Here's another one called BodyPix. By the way, all the demos don't work with images. They just, uh, images make for the best demos, which is why we show them. So BodyPix, this is doing segmentation, and it can also do part maps. So you see how it vaguely knows the difference between my head and my hand? This is super powerful. And the opportunity here is um, all these models written in Python and converted to a JavaScript format, so you're not going to lose your jobs. Um, but this opens up new opportunities. Like you could imagine if you wanted to build a game, think about how cool of a game you could build running in the browser just using something like this as input. There's so many new possibilities that you can work on. And what I wanted to point you to, I'm slowly learning JavaScript, and it's going, it's going to be a long journey. I learned how to write my first for loop in JavaScript recently. But if you go to tensorflow.org slash JS, what I wanted to point you to is the good news is in the beginner's API, you saw things like dense layers and convolutional layers. Exactly the same API works in JavaScript. Almost exactly. It's like 99% the same. So you define a model. It's a sequential model. And then you can add different layers to it. You can compile the model, and you can fit the model. And the important takeaway here is that um, the same beginner's API that you can work it with in Python also works in JavaScript. And what this means is if you want to develop machine learning models in JavaScript, you don't have any additional machine learning to learn. You just need to learn basic JavaScript syntax. And so this is um, a really, really cool space, and it's a huge opportunity. Because this is new, there's not a lot of work that's been done in JavaScript. And so it's a great opportunity for machine learning developers to try something new. Um, OK. 
here are some learning resources to learn more. And so we'll, we'll close with this. Basically, I mentioned this a couple times, all the tutorials you want are on slash alpha. I have two book recommendations for you, both of which are phenomenally good. So the first is Deep Learning with Python. This is a book, I, I'm bad with uh, French pronunciation, but Francois Cholet, who is the author of, thank you, who is the author of Keras, is absolutely brilliant. I've learned a ton from him. And this book is an introduction to deep learning in Keras that actually doesn't mention TensorFlow at all, but I mentioned that TensorFlow has a superset of the Keras API. So anything you learn about in this book is not wasted, and that transfers directly to TensorFlow. You just change the imports. Um, it's an introduction to deep learning with no math. So it's basically, here's how you do the thing, and it gives you a really good intuitive understanding of what's happening. The second book, I'm gonna butcher this pronunciation, is from Aurelien Geron. Anyway, Aurelien is brilliant. Um, you should wait one or two months for the new version of this book. Here's the title. Uh, the current version uses TensorFlow 1, which you shouldn't learn. Wait two months, he's almost finished updating it for TensorFlow 2. And if you go on GitHub and you search for the title of the book GitHub, he has these really nicely done notebooks that uh, teach TensorFlow 2, which I'd really highly recommend. And then there's uh, two classes that are really good. The first is Intro to Deep Learning. It's from Alex and Ava at MIT. They're awesome. I should mention this, this is a fast course, so if you have a lot of experience already, this is an awesome, awesome uh, intro. And then there's another really good course from Stanford, which uh, has a fancy title, but the reason I'm recommending it to you is the first few lectures from the course they talk about things like k-nearest neighbors, they talk about things like gradient descent, they talk about backpropagation, they talk about dense layers. Really, this is an introduction to deep learning, focusing on CNNs, it's not just about CNNs, they're great. Um, yeah, and then I'll be around uh, for about an hour if I can help with anything. Thanks very much, this was really, really fun. Uh, the slides are all online at the link here. And yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Can I, can I take any questions while I have you all here? And you can ask them offline too if you'd prefer. I'll be around, you can ask them offline. So thanks a lot.